Innovation in public diplomacy is something that the first museum uh, to tell the story of diplomacy and its challenges and its history and its people, we think that's a pretty innovative thing. And so we're really happy to be uh, the place where you're, you're, um, uh, that you're uh, here today for. So without any more of my talking, I would like to hand this over to Jay Wang, who is the director of the USC Public Diplomacy Center. And thank you very much, Jay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Susan. Um, welcome uh, to our Innovation Forum. We are very delighted to be back in Washington, D.C. to host our first uh, major in-person program since the pandemic. I would like to thank the National Museum of American Diplomacy for partnering with us on today's program. Thank you, to Susan, Hillary, and your wonderful team uh, to make this happen. And they say that there's a museum to everything in Washington, D.C. And we're certainly glad that there is a museum dedicated to diplomacy, sharing the story of, of the nation's engagement with the world, which is part and parcel of the American experience. And now more than ever, we also need thoughtful, creative dialogue with our citizens on why and how international affairs impact their lives and their communities, and why they should care. Today's event with the theme of innovation is a continuation of the story of American di diplomacy. Innovation and creativity are now key to effective conduct of public diplomacy and to building bridges between America and the world in a digitally enabled environment. We at the Center on Public Diplomacy are proud to play a role in helping to shape and enrich the discussions and debates about innovative practices and processes in, a growing, in this growing field of public diplomacy through our study, research, training, and this convening. Um, our work is guided by a global vision, a drive to integrate research and practice, and a commitment to preparing the next generation of public diplomacy and international communication leaders, scholars, and practitioners that reflect our nation's rich diversity and the international community at large. We do all of this against the backdrop of the global city of Los Angeles. And I'm always delighted to be in Washington, D.C. to share and learn with our partners here. And I see some of you in the audience today. Uh, we'll be introducing our distinguished speakers in a minute. I would like to take a minute to acknowledge several special guests in the audience. The Honorable Ed Royce. Um, and, uh, and Stock. And uh, Barry Sanders, Chair of CPD's Advisory Commission, uh, uh, Advisory Board, not Commission. <laughs> Again, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us and for your support. I look forward to having more of you getting involved in our work to help lead the field building effort and to help make CPD uh, this very small academic institute more spectacular. Thank you. And uh, now it is my distinct honor to invite Elizabeth Allen acting under secretary of public diplomacy and public affairs to deliver opening remarks hi everybody thank you jay thank you so much for that kind introduction i have to say i am very heartened to be in this room amongst many friends um, and people that I have had the pleasure of working with and for for many years. Um, as we gather together, this is one of the first in-person gatherings we've been able to have at the museum in many years. It is very fitting that it is this group that is here to talk about driving public diplomacy forward because it is the work of many of you in this room and the passion that's very close to our hearts because we know that PD has to be central to our foreign policy strategy every day. Um, I want to thank Susan Cleary and NMAD for hosting us here. As Jay mentioned, it's critical that we have a museum that celebrates American public diplomacy, so no more fitting space to do this event. And I know at the reception, everyone will have a chance to check out the exhibits. Um, and I want to also thank USC, obviously. USC is a vital partner of ours um, and an incubator for cutting edge PD research, multi multidisciplinary practice, and for PD professionals themselves, whose work will help shape public diplomacy for years to come. And as I've said to Jay privately, I'll say uh, here as well, I'm very much looking forward to visiting the city of Los Angeles and USC, as he mentioned, particularly with the beautiful weather. So we're here to focus on innovation in public diplomacy and the practice of public diplomacy. 
As we all know, PD has always been central to connecting with and engaging public audiences, building networks, communicating timely and truthful information, and building long-term relationships. We must meet today's challenges using every effective and available PD tool at our disposal, and as I'm hoping to focus on, and I know many of our colleagues are focusing on, designing tools and resources for the future as we try to think ahead beyond just the day-to-day -day needs. The information space is rapidly changing, as you all know. The way people are communicating and connecting with each other is rapidly changing. And it's up to us at the State Department to do our part in partnership with all of you to meet those global challenges and to be central to this effort. We cannot take for granted um, what we only know in government. We are very eager to be working with people outside of government. I see partners in this room, Meridian among them. Um, and we are humbled by knowing that we will only get better by harnessing the power of things that are happening inside and outside of government. I will say that it's week four for me in this new role. I was previously Assistant Secretary for Global Public Affairs since last summer. Um, and as I've been settling into the role as our senior official, I have to say I'm really guided by two things. One is um, intense pride in the really good work that's being done knowing that we are, we are constantly pushing ourselves, and particularly in this moment of um, what's happening in Ukraine, public diplomacy is front and center to our foreign policy strategy. It is not an extra part of our foreign policy strategy, it is the strategy. And so this is a moment for our PD work to shine, to build on, to learn from, to ask more resources, uh, and, and to go from there. But, but I'm also guided by knowing that there's a lot more that we can do. Um, and that it's all of you working with us that is gonna help us grow and scale and innovate to the point of our discussions here today. I'd like to just speak a little bit um, about what we are doing, knowing that we have a lot of work to do. I would say in our messaging, we know that it's not enough for the United States to simply state the truth or to call out disinformation and propaganda. We are also cultivating networks, thank you ECA, of individuals who are championing shared values and we are amplifying trusted, credible, credible voices in communities that we're trying to target to get our messaging into. We all know and we are again humbled by the fact that the US government's voice is necessary but not sufficient in making sure that we're reaching communities and people across the world. So through our exchange programs, we're building lasting relationships to help us do just that. Over 1.7 million people globally have participated in US government exchanges, including one third of current world government leaders. And alumni of our programs from all over the world account for the thousands of leaders in business, civil society, and academia who are finding and implementing innovative solutions to emerging challenges. I wanna call out that that includes ECA's Digital Communications Network, or DCN, which is a network of civil society leaders, academics, former government officials, and other influencers who after years and years of networking and training through our programs are able to, to message credible information to communities and they are proving to be a really critical part about combating and calling out misinformation and disinformation in Ukraine in particular. So we are seeing our work brought to bear every day in very, very meaningful ways. We're also using data to strengthen our ability to analyze and communicate with our audiences while also evaluating our efforts in real time. We know that we must hold ourselves accountable and give our PD practitioners across the world the tools to be able to help themselves in real time and adjust on the fly, knowing the pace of our information space these days. In our effort to modernize the practice of public diplomacy overseas, we went back to the drawing board and we reconceived the very basic functions of PD in our missions across the world. PDSI doesn't necessarily mean a lot to you, but our public diplomacy staffing initiative sir, means a lot to our PD practitioners overseas. Um, it has been a multi-year process, often very onerous for our practitioners in the field, we know, but we are sure seeing it bear some fruit in terms of redesigning teams, redefining positions, and giving our practitioners a more collaborative structure through which to manage their PD programs rather than being hindered by the structures of the past that are not set up to meet our strategy. We also initiated an internal talent management process to assess the needs of our team, and we're committed to creating a PD workforce to take advantage of the new tools and opportunities. And I only wanted to share some of these things today because while they may sound administrative and they may sound bureaucratic, I think we can agree that management of our PD programs and investment in the most important resource that we have, our people, is what's going to drive us forward, as we all often get subsumed by programmatic details and budget challenges, we are keenly aware that it takes management of our resources and our people to really drive us forward and to be able to keep our strategy nimble. 
Our PD practitioners that I speak of have demonstrated a very impressive ability to think creatively, adapt to this new information environment, and engage people where they are, on the platforms they're on, and with messages that resonate. As I like to say, a PD strategy is not copy-pasting press guidance into Twitter. So um, I am very proud of the work that a lot of our people are doing um, to push beyond just a media mindset and getting back to a people-first mindset. And in that vein, I'll share two quick examples because I like to leave people with illustrative vision about what PD is actually doing in the field. One of them is about the Secretary's recent travel to Brussels. Now, the Secretary likes to joke that in his time as Secretary of State, he has spent much more time in Brussels than anywhere else in the world besides Washington, D.C. And that's clearly for good reason, because as he came in, it was, a, it was a priority of his to rebuild the very foundation of our diplomacy by investing in relationships with our allies and partners, most of which is done through our multilateral organizational relationships in Brussels, particularly on Russia, Ukraine. So you can imagine that as he and others, including the President, have been to Brussels enumerate times in the last year, when he went a few weeks ago, we thought, you know, the media's really had their fill. We've thrown our officials at the local media in Brussels. What do we do with our media time that can be a little bit different? And so what we did, we created a Telegram account from the US State Department um, back in February for the first time ever, knowing how Telegram penetrates into Russian audiences in Russia and the region in a way that media does not or cannot, given that it's being blocked. And so when Secretary Blinken was in Brussels just a few weeks ago, our, our colleagues at the Brussels Media Hub and in GPA and at Post solicited questions from Russian journalists and were able to then pose them to the secretary and stitch it all together, essentially as an interview of Secretary Blinken by a variety of Russian journalists who otherwise would not have been able to have access to him and would not have been able to break through on their own platforms, but for our US government Telegram account. So we are constantly pushing ourselves in that way. The same can be said for all of our exchange program alumni who we are also equipping and resourcing to think beyond, um, to think beyond traditional solutions and to be innovative. So I wanted to call out um, a 2017 Mandela Washington Fellow alumni from Malawi who at the height of the COVID-19 surge in 2020 created an app in Malawi called Hey Neighbor. And he used that app to cultivate trusted information from the CDC the World Health Organization and his health ministry to distribute to people in communities who would trust him as a community leader. And he has since reached over 650,000 people in Malawi with that trusted information about the pandemic and how to get vaccinated. Just an example of how our training is paying dividends. Finally, and I will wrap it up, I'd like to take the time to recognize the Ameri Prize for Innovation in Public Diplomacy. Through this collaboration between the State Department and USC to celebrate innovation in PD, this award emphasizes that creative thinking isn't an option, it's a mindset, and a critical one. So in that spirit, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge last year's winners, Gretchen Frank and Chadwick Houghton. And Chad is here with us today, and we'll hear, with him, hear from him shortly. <laughs> Chad and Gretchen use data and technology to design and implement a customized public diplomacy platform to counter disinformation in Poland. And it is because of their innovative work right in Poland at that local level that we in DC took a fresh and more global look at what kind of tools we were providing to people across the world in this vein to get to the same solution. They are what the award signifies, the demonstration of PD at its best at a time when our tools and skills are needed more than ever to advance key national security and foreign policy priorities, Chad and Gretchen are the best of us. And they are a reminder to all of us to continue to prioritize creative public diplomacy. Congratulations again, Chad and Gretchen. You are our role models and you are true innovation entrepreneurs. I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion and hearing many more examples of innovative PD. I'm very humbled to be here um, with this esteemed group and particularly, if I may, this esteemed group of women leaders. I am very humbled to be counted among you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as uh, the acting undersecretary mentioned that we launched the Public Diplomacy Innovation Prize last year in collaboration with the State Department. And uh, Chad is uh, one of our recipients and I would like uh, to invite him to come to the podium to share uh, some of his experiences with the uh, program. So uh, first of all, thank you to the Center on Public Diplomacy um, for creating this award for having the vision and the foresight to, uh, to put this into practice 
and to the R Leadership family for supporting this, and to the embassy uh, team that we worked with. Gretchen and I were incredibly fortunate to work with a, an immensely talented local staff. Uh, we had an ambassador that was incredibly supportive of the work we were doing, and we had a tremendous leadership team, our PAO and others, that really came together and supported us in this project. Um, you know, what does this award mean, really, uh, at the end of the day? Uh, Jay said, you know, I really want you to talk about what this award has meant. And obviously, it's recognition for work that has been done, and, and that feels good uh, from time to time. But more than anything, what it has done is it's given Gretchen and I a platform and a voice to talk about issues that otherwise we might not have been able to bring to the surface. Uh, you know, we won this award for, as was mentioned, developing a, an AI-based uh, countering disinformation tool. Um, and, you know, oftentimes in our department, we are buried sort of within this kind of bureaucratic, very hierarchical, layered structure. And it's hard sometimes to have your voice heard, particularly if you feel like you have, uh, you know, something important to say or you have a contribution you want to make. And so, you know, this award gives us an opportunity to kind of break through that and to have a chance to talk about what we've done and, and, and some of the ideas that we have. Uh, and it's had a real tremendous impact already. Uh, so Gretchen and I, since uh, we returned from LA and we, we were graciously hosted by uh, CPD to do uh, a, a, an in-residence program at the university uh, where we were able to do guest lectures, where we were able to meet with student and faculty uh, and some really innovative, interesting people doing groundbreaking work uh, in this field. And uh, as a result, when we came back, we had an opportunity to meet with a number of regional bureaus. Uh, last week, we just met with the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs. We have met with a number of other regional bureaus, folks outside of the State Department, to talk about what we did, to talk about how we could take the ideas that we put in place in Poland and expand them across the public diplomacy continuum. We partnered with the Foreign Service Institute to develop uh, a module, uh, a curriculum and a module and to teach uh, one of the very first countering disinformation courses that we've had at the Foreign Service Institute. Uh, we've had two iterations of that course. It's gone extremely well. We've been able to connect with students after the course who've reached out to us and said, hey, you know, I have this idea, I have this project. Can you guys give me some input on, on what you learned in Poland and how we can apply it to the project that we're working on? And so there's been an amplification effect on just being able to, 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 be, to step up on this platform and have our voice heard and connect with other people in a way that we wouldn't have been able to do had we not had an opportunity uh, through this recognition. Uh, and that really brings me to kind of the key point that I wanted to, to make here today. Uh, unfortunately, Gretchen couldn't be here with us, but she and I had a conversation about this. And so this also reflects some of her thinking as well, and it's been mentioned already to some degree. You know, we're at this key inflection point in the field of public diplomacy. The world has changed dramatically uh, since, uh, from 10, 15 years ago in the way that we do this work. Um, Gretchen and I built this tool in Poland with, uh, in partnership with a, a firm, and then we took it and tried to expand it within, within, other, within the region. We had a number of embassies who were interested in it. Uh, we had great support from the, the bureau, the regional bureau. Uh, we were unfortunately unable to secure funding, and we're still fighting and still advocating to try to do that. Um, but I think it illustrates a larger point, right? We're doing this work in a new age, uh, and we are, are engaging in a completely different landscape. We are, you know, you imagine yourself as the press officer in an embassy around the world. You've, you've got, you know, not only are you trying to do the regular day-to-day -day job of the press and creatively figure out how to message uh, on different things, but you're doing it in an information environment where you have multiple malign actors who are working at cross purposes to what you're doing, right? And you have the same number of people, in many cases, the same budgets and the same tools that you had years before. And so it's really hard to do that with the same amount of resources and the same kind of way of doing it that you've been doing for 15 years, and it's, it's really difficult. Um, so imagine that officer in the field needing to kind of comb through all this data and to do all of this work. You can't do it as a single human being. No individual person can do that, and this is where the AI tools come into play. This is where what we did in Poland has scalability and has the ability to go more, more broadly and bring this technology and tools to other people. But it has to be field-based, right? This needs to be not something that's built in Washington that sort of has kind of a centralization effect, but it takes into account the thoughts and the experiences and the knowledge of the people who are working in the field. Uh, and this is complicated stuff. We've got these, this press officer in the field, uh, you know, their budget is probably, you know, 
paying their local staff a couple of newspaper subscriptions and maybe some, some images and some videos that they want to do. But it certainly isn't developing these technology platforms. It certainly isn't going out and, and trying to engage local firms to creatively come up with messaging solutions. We were able to do what we did in Poland because of COVID, right? Because we'd stopped doing in-person programming and we had an opportunity to basically repurpose that funding and go out and do something interesting and different with the leadership support at the embassy. And so, you know, the message really is we've got to change this. We have got to invest more in the field. We've got to invest more in public diplomacy because the reality is that our adversaries are doing that. They're investing in AI-based solutions. They're putting analysts and skilled uh, technicians in the field to do this work. And this is what we're competing against when we go out and we try to convey these messages to the public. Um, you know, recently we saw these horrific images coming out of Bucha in Ukraine, and I think it's made clear more than ever that the stakes in this are incredibly high. They could not be higher right now in this, in this battle. And the reality is we're in an information war at the moment, whether it's declared or not, whether we want to sort of put that out there, we are in this information war, and we're not necessarily winning in every part of the, of the world. And, and so, and we're sending our people to the front lines sometimes, ill-equipped to manage in this new information war, but there's hope. We heard some, uh, some of it earlier. There's, there's a lot of programs. We're introducing the Data-Driven Diplomacy Initiative. We've got a lot of energy and passion within the building to change this. And so I think we're at a key inflection point where we have the ability and the capability and the desire to change uh, the course that we're on. Uh, my current boss, Secretary Kerry, he likes to say when we are confronted with climate pessimists around the globe, that despite all of this, despite the, the fact that this is, yes, this is hard, yes, this is a, these are seemingly insurmountable challenges, but at the end of the day, I'm an optimist, is what he always says, and I agree with that. Uh, I am an optimist, and I know that this can, can be done, and, you know, and that's really what this is all about at the end of the day. Uh, you know, I want to thank CPD, I want to thank the State Department and everyone who made this award possible who gave Gretchen and I a voice and a platform to step on and to peek our heads above the bureaucracy and tell our story and hopefully in the process inspire people to join us and collaborate with us in trying to tackle what truly is, I think, one of the most challenging and pressing issues in our public diplomacy field today. Thank you very much for the award on behalf of Gretchen and for inviting us here today as well. Well, Thank you, Chad. Uh, to ensure the continued success of this wonderful program, um, CPD uh, Advisory Board Chair Barry Sanders uh, will announce the establishment of an endowment fund uh, to, um, to ensure the sustainability of this program. Barry? Thank you, Jay, but you already gave the announcement. <laughs> well, as you could... As you could hear from Chad's remarks, that um, he and our other first laureate of this annual award are most worthy recipients, and it's the most important award. Uh, and now I can tell you what you already know, which is that through the generosity and commitment of Goli Ameri, this is an endowed award which will last in perpetuity. It'll outlast all of us, even Methuselah here. Uh, it's, uh, it's important and it's now fully endowed. It'll be forever known as the Amerian Prize for, Ameri Prize for Innovation in Public Diplomacy. Thank you, Goli. <laughs> now, now, many of you know Goli personally. This is a remarkable American. She is a serial entrepreneur, a recidivist, so to speak, uh, in the world of high technology where she's been enormously successful. Uh, she's won so many awards, including, I particularly like the Ellis Island Gold Medal of Honor. Uh, and more than that, more than anything, this is a person of enormous intelligence, sophistication, and charm. The qualities you want in a diplomat. Frankly, the qualities you'd like in everyone. But we have them in Goli. Uh, her work in diplomacy, has fu been fulfilling a number of roles. She was the head of the U.S. delegation to the U.N. General Assembly. She was also, of course, Assistant Secretary for Educational and Cultural Affairs. Um, then she, after serving the U.S. government, served as an, uh, uh, I guess it's a deputy, um, uh, uh, deputy uh, 
uh, what's the, the title? Uh, what is it at the at the Red Cross? Yes. Okay. And um, at but I mean at the uh, at the uh, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent. So, um, De Deputy Secretary General. Right. Thank you. In in making this generous gift, what Goley's doing is showing her threefold commitments. Uh, one of them is to her colleagues with whom she served and those who served afterward and those who will yet serve at the State Department. Strong commitment of hers. The other is her commitment to public diplomacy as Chad just described it and its importance. And the last one is her commitment for the Center on Public Diplomacy. We thank her for all three of those commitments and for this wonderful gift. So Goli, please come up and say a few remarks. Gosh, that was embarrassing. <laughs> okay, um, first of all, thank you all so much for um, coming today to support this prize and sending a greater message that innovation and leveraging the tools of technology will further the work of the U.S. government in everything that it does. Um, I want to thank USC, the Center for Public Diplomacy, Jay as the director and Barry as the chair for taking the center to a whole new level and turning it into an innovation hub. And of course, I want to thank our amazing pa panel of current and former Assistant Secretaries of State who are here for ECA that have consistently done a magnificent job in enhancing the work of the Bureau and constantly building and rebuilding on what's been done in the past. So again, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I also want to thank Under Secretary Allen for your incredibly articulate remarks. Honestly, I don't think I could have said it any better myself. You really hit the nail right on the head. Thank you for your thoughts and thanks so much for being here. You know, the Bureau, as you mentioned, um, which in my humble opinion has always been um, very bipartisan, but or even better yet, nonpartisan, you know, works on behalf of the American people to create mutual understanding with people and nations around the world. And um, however, you know, in our current um, innovation economy, where technology rules and it impacts every aspect of our lives, the State Department's motivated officers like Chad, where are you? Yeah, and thank you so much for those incredible remarks because you know better than most of us sitting here what you have to deal with day in and day out. You know, we need to be able to give people like Chad and every other Foreign Service officer and civil servant, you know, every tool at their disposal to be able to create this kind of understanding and countering the half-truths that we hear globally. And I think as we all know, Internationally, the United States is a prime target of misinformation. And our hope at USC is that for this prize to highlight the invaluable work that dedicated Foreign Service officers, Chad, like you and Gretchen do every day, but you do so much with so little. Um, I am really truly honored to be here and to be associated with this prize because I'm a first generation immigrant who found myself in the ideals of this country. This country and everything that it stands for truly empowered me. It helped me understand that what matters in an ideal society is freedom, democracy, equality, freedom, human rights, women's and minority rights, and helping those in need, and always, always thinking about the greater good. That's why public diplomacy has always sung to me. I want the rest of the world to experience the United States the way I have experienced it. And, um, and to see a society, warts and all, that questions itself and is constant, consistently on the path to self-improvement and can, is consistently on the path to self-improvement and can do what it does best to serve its constituents in the best possible manner. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Goli. Uh, thank you for your heartfelt, inspiring words. And your gift, as uh, Barry said, is not just to the center, it's to the field of public diplomacy. And uh, we're most grateful. Uh, to help us continue our uh, discussion and exploration of innovation in public diplomacy, we have a very distinguished panel. And I would like to introduce Catherine Brown, who is the CEO and uh, 
the president of Global Ties and a proud member of CPD's advisory board. Uh, she will be moderating the discussion and introducing our uh, speakers. Yes. Hi, everyone. Great to be with you. Goli, thank you so much. I, I first met Goli when I was a junior congressional staffer, like it feels like a lifetime ago. And um, you inspired me so much back then, and it's really incredible what you've done here. So thank you. And I'm thrilled to introduce uh, three extraordinary women who led and are leading the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, which, as we all know, directs the State Department's global efforts to engage individuals through academic, cultural, professional sports, and youth exchanges. Um, we, I'm going to be super fast because we want to get all these women up here um, to give their remarks, and then we're going to have a um, brief panel discussion. But first, I am I'm excited to introduce Evan Ryan who is Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs from 2013 to 2017, and currently serves as the White House Cabinet Secretary. Hi, everyone. Um, this, what a wonderful event. And I have not been back here. Um, the State Department, uh, my time at the State Department was just, don't tell my current boss, but my favorite time. <laughs> and I've, I loved my job at ECA so much. And it's so wonderful to be a member of this sisterhood of ECA assistant secretaries. And I learned so much from Anne. Um, I'm just so proud to know Marie and Goli and Lee Satterfield is, I've, I've always said, probably the most qualified, most experienced ECA assistant secretary there ever was. I'm so, so proud that she's here and in this role and really glad to be with you all here today. Um, so while I'm not here day to day, I do try to keep tabs on the State Department and try to hear a little bit about what's going on. Um, and uh, so thrilled to, to know that Goalie's investment um, and work with USC is going to be um, something that lives on and something that really highlights the power, the importance of public diplomacy in the world today. Um, you've heard from acting under Secretary Allen, um, the amazing, amazing power of public diplomacy. I know we're all excited to speak a little bit about ECA's specific role in that. Um, so, so many, many, um, many people may define innovation only as actual technology coding, hardware, software, and more. While those are key components, I think of innovation as multidimensional. What does this mean? Our approach to public diplomacy has changed in many ways over the years, and in the last decade alone, innovation has accelerated that change even more. Let me share a few examples from the Obama-Biden administration where we leveraged innovation to bring people together on some of the key issues during that time. In 2015, as our acting undersecretary mentioned, we launched the Digital Communications Network, which has only grown in scale and scope and importance. Also known as DCN, this program was designed to strengthen the skills of communications professionals on the digital spectrum so that they could produce quality, credible information and digital content. Also, they served as credible voices to their local audiences and helped counter the negative impact of disinformation and, and propaganda. And as um, our acting undersecretary mentioned, this was really driven by what we were seeing coming out of Russia um, back in 2014-15, um, and, and that's when this was established. Through exchanges like this, we strengthen civil society, promote free and independent media, expand free markets, and enhance opportunities for people of all backgrounds. Today, the DCN plays a critical role in how we innovatively approach our efforts across Eastern Europe and Russia. While disinformation and misinformation are two key issues of our time, so is climate change. That's why we launched, during uh, my time um, at ECA, Our Cities, Our Climate, a Bloomberg Philanthropies U.S. Department of State partnership. Through this public-private partnership, we were able to harness the innovative strategies and practices of leaders at the local level, international sustainability directors who traveled to the U.S., and U.S. mayors who traveled abroad, who do the heavy lifting day in and day out to address climate change. Now that the United States has rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement, I'm hopeful that under Lee's leadership, ECA will pursue new innovative strategies to address climate change. Finally, I want to share two examples of how the United States is leading on both innovation and empowering youth, the Young African Leadership Initiative 
YALI, and the Young Southeastern Asian Initiative, YSEALI. Both exchanges leverage innovation and entrepreneurship to empower youth in key strategic areas of the world. These programs started under Assistant Secretary Stock and have lasted three presidents and now four assistant secretaries. So most importantly, it has expanded its scale and scope to reach even more people abroad and here in the United States. Each of these examples of innovative public diplomacy efforts have laid a strong foundation for what's next. I look forward to a robust conversation with you all today on the topic. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, next, we're going to hear from Marie Voice. Uh, Marie was Assistant Secretary of State for ECA from 2018 until January 2021, and is currently the CEO of Marie Voice LLC and serves on the board of Cognito Health. Right? And USC. And USC Center for Public Diplomacy, yes. Thank you. Good afternoon. So thank you, Catherine, and it's so wonderful to see my colleagues, the Assistant Secretaries and Liz and uh, Chad and USC, thank you, and Ed, thanks for coming. Uh, my husband is an alum as well. Um, but I'm really here to say thank you to our former Assistant Secretary, Goli and Mary, uh, for establishing, establishing the Endowment Fund. It comes at a time when innovation and creat creativity take on a special urgency. There is a growing division between nations, led by those who believe in a rule-based order, and those in Moscow, Moscow and Beijing who seek to dismantle the rules-based system. This would lead to a world where autocratic governments deploy force to undermine democracy and gain territory at the expense of weaker states. ECA, continues to staunchly support international norms and values, including democracy, liberty, and the rule of law. International Visitor Leadership Program alumna Florida Faber of Albania spoke at the 80th anniversary ceremony. Her words touched my heart. Quote, the story of my country, it's also my story. I was educated in school being told America is our strongest enemy. I became an international citizen of this world when I participated in the IVLP program. And today I stand in front of you as the first woman ambassador of the Republic of Albania to the United States. The United States was the first country that showed strong support so that the Albanian people could realize their dreams. This is where the support of the United States comes in and the power of the programs. In Albania, we had to think of ways to change a communist one-party system to a democracy and embrace the values of the West. The accountability in government and business program gave me a unique perspective. Unquote. When a leader like Ambassador Florida Faber returns home from America with that knowledge, we are surely changing the world. In Moldova, USG alumni feature prominently in the new national government. On July 11, 2021, Moldova held historic parliamentary elections in which the pro-reform, pro-West, Action and Solidarity Party, known as PASS, won a majority of the seats. Alumni are in both the new government and the parliament, a legacy of nearly 30 years of cultivating lasting relationships between the United States and Moldovan leaders. Alumni serve as Prime Minister, Minister of Internal Affairs, Minister of Economy, Minister of Agriculture, and as Deputy Prime Minister for Reintegration. In addition, eight alumni won seats in the parliament. Prime Minister Natalia Garvalita is alumna of the Edmund S. Muskie Internship Program. 
Meanwhile, the youngest member of parliament is an alumnus of the Future Leader Exchange, FLEX. United States alumna Kelly Zug, who participated in the 2013 Fulbright ETA program said, quote, specifically while working in Ukraine, I realized the marriage of necessity between cultural diplomacy and security because understanding cultures allows us to foster alliances and international relations, but also that security builds that necessary foundation for the longevity of trust and development initiatives in foreign policy, unquote. Ukrainians have been so effective because while tanks, missiles, and fighter jets matter, and they are certainly outgunned, ideas matter too. One of the reasons that Putin's forces have struggled so mightily is that President Zelensky has rallied his nation in a way we never expected, to fight for an idea, to fight for freedom. While the Kremlin has invaded Ukraine, this is a war with global significance. Ukraine should be a wake-up call, underscoring in its dramatic and horrific way what has been developing since the end of the Cold War, a stark battle between democratic freedom and authoritarianism. The Kremlin, Kremlin and the CCP are closing all space for conversation and debate because it fundamentally threatens their power. They are using the power of the state to manipulate and distort reality to serve their purposes. They are challenging the fundamental notions of territorial integrity and democracy that have been mainly accepted since the end of World War II. Goli Amiri, thank you for your contribution in empowering those who want freedom and an international order which values peace. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome our current Assistant Secretary for ECA um, and formerly the uh, President Chief Operating Officer of Meridian, Lee Satterfield. Thank you, Catherine. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be joining you here today. And thank you, Jay and Barry, for bringing us all together. It's such an important um, moment in time, and I think that's been said, and to be able to bring together public diplomacy practitioners and talk about innovation and what's ahead is um, the right place for us to be right now. And um, honestly, looking around the room, I think, what an amazing confab of people. And I hope someone has alerted the rest of the building that the good ideas people are in the house because this is where the good programs are generated by all of you, our program partners, like has been mentioned. And I just wanted to join um, those who have already said, and I think Evan said, this sisterhood, that to be able to join this important sisterhood. When I was going through the confirmation process myself not that long ago, um, every single one of the former assistant secretaries for ECA contacted the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on my behalf and advocated for my confirmation. That's incredible. And I think it speaks to what Goley said, that this work cuts across administrations. It is not just bipartisan, it is nonpartisan. It's on behalf of the United States of America. And you can see the threads of this work through every single president, every secretary, every assistant secretary, all throughout the way. And I love, Goli, that you mentioned uh, building on the programs that have been done before each one of us served in the role. And I, I'm constantly amazed by the strength of the continuation of some of the things that I know Ann Stock started and I know Marie Roy started because she told them about me when we got together and that I saw Evan, I saw Evan Ryan build and I know that Goalie was a part of creating. So 
Um, I'm just humbled, was that your word? To be among this amazing group of women, to uh, be able to continue the good work and to build on what's already been done. Uh, it's also amazing to be here with Liz Allen, the acting undersecretary for public diplomacy. It is clear to see why the secretary and the president asked her to fill this role. There is no stronger, stronger advocate for public diplomacy and exchanges in ECA than Liz Allen. So thanks, Liz, for being here with us today, really. Um, really, yeah. Um, Goalie, wow. The fact that you've um, put your, as Ann and I said earlier, your money where your mouth is and are holding up those who are in the field being innovative and creating programs. And we must continue to highlight the work that's being done of these individuals, these foreign service officers in the field who are uh, able to sort of push away the noise and the bureaucracy, if you will, forgive me, um, and be innovative. And so thank you. And Goli, it, it's special what you've done. So thank you for bringing us all together under this important initiative that you've, you've funded for the forever. So as has been said, I'm the current Assistant Secretary for Educational and Cultural Affairs. And um, I'll just say the state of the world is changing, right? And um, we've got to be innovative. And uh, if we're not, we're going to lose. We've got to change and we've got to keep up. Our success can be measured not only by how we keep up with current events and technology, but how we stay a step ahead. And that's why ECA has been so good at this work, constantly staying a step ahead. Secretary Blinken recently spoke about emerging technologies and how the standards and norms, the rules by which those technologies are used, will have a great impact on our lives. That's why our new Office of Monitoring, Evaluation, Learning, and Innovation uses data-driven metrics to inform our public diplomacy focus as well as develops programs that use emerging technologies to reach new audiences. That's key, reach new audiences. Whether it's virtual programming or gaming, we're better equipped to meet audiences where they are and in meaningful ways. One thing that we've learned is there is an incredible appetite for ECA to expand our science, technology, engineering, and mathematics programming even more. Recently, in partnership with the White House Office of Science and Technology, ECA launched two new STEM-related initiatives, the Early Career Research Initiative and the Academic Training Extension. I want to recognize Nicole Elkon, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary currently joining us here today, and she successfully <laughs> worked with her team to announce those amazing programs. I think we have over 30 or 40 private sector companies already signed up to host students in STEM, and that, that, that is thanks to her leadership. The early career STEM effort seeks to bring together the Bridge USA sponsors, and that's for others of you who don't yet know our marketing, Bridge USA, that's the J1 visa programs. We connect those uh, Bridge USA sponsors with US-based businesses to increase the number of STEM-focused exchange visitors where they can partner with the US private sector, arguably one of America's greatest assets. It was brilliant. It was a category of STEM visitors that was mostly, um, were mostly in academic institutes and organizations. So the idea was to bring together private sector and allow them to host and then be innovative and partner on the field of STEM. So in addition to that program, we launched the um, academic training extension, which now allows to double the time that someone in that field of study can stay in the United States to continue being innovative and working in the classroom and as a scholar. Over the last 10 years, we've experienced great success with tech women and tech girls, which bring women and girls to tech, from tech to the United States to mentor with women in STEM. 
We've also seen positive met metrics and made continued investments in TechCamp. TechCamp sends American tech experts overseas to engage local tech leaders in their communities on ways to innovate and address key issues, climate, disinformation, economic opportunity, civic participation, and public health. I want to pause for a minute and point this out as another example of a lasting program that cuts across in a partisanship. These programs have grown over the course of multiple administrations, and there's really something to be said for that, as we already have. Finally, I want to share something we just recently launched, and it brings foreign policy to U.S. citizens and the global community. On World Heritage Day, which was April 18th, ECA's Cultural Heritage Center launched a public-private partnership with Google Arts and Culture. Whether you're a student in Indonesia, a museum curator in Egypt, a teacher in my home state of South Carolina, or an aspiring archaeologist in Argentina, with just a simple swipe on a smartphone or a tablet or computer, anyone can access some of our most historic cultural sites around the world. In our first tranche of content, we highlighted the center's work with the Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation with more than 1,000 projects from over 130 countries showcased on that platform. In fact, we had more than 100,000 impressions on social media thanks to our activation and the compelling content. Often when I'm asked exactly what we do, I simply answer, ECA brings foreign policy to life through life-changing exchanges, strategic programming, and compelling storytelling. There's no greater catalyst for our mission to create mutual understanding than innovation. Thank you for bringing us together. I'm excited for our conversation. Okay, yes, your mics are right, right behind you there. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to each of you. I, um, I'm just going to ask one question because I know we, the group has a lot of questions probably for you, and we only have about 15 minutes. So, um, so I wanted to ask one question, which is that one of the things that I love um, about public diplomacy so much is meeting the beneficiaries, um, the, um, the US citizens and the, the foreign citizens. So I was hoping that, um, that all of you could take a second and reflect on um, one of your favorite moments meeting an innovator, innovator, a trailblazer, um, an alum of, of the programs. And what, what did you learn from them? Um, Maria you talked a little bit about the IVLP alum. That's a program that's very close to our heart at Global Ties. Um, but I wanted to hear from all of you, what, what's one of your favorite moments as Assistant Secretary and for you, Lee, so far in meeting um, the beneficiaries of this program and what, what about what they were doing um, and their innovation really stuck out and stuck with you? Okay. Um, I, I would say I have, I, there's so many that it's hard to, to, to pick one because one of the things that I think ECA um, is very powerful in being able to do is you're interacting with people around the world who sometimes are being awakened to opportunities as a result of their their work with ECA or their exchange program that they had not otherwise um, you know known about. Um, if I had to think of um, of one, I'm sorry, I'm like it's a little bit swirling. Um, there was a young um, leader. We get we started a, a youth award program. Um, and one of these young leaders, and I'm drawing a blank on his name right now, um, went back and, uh, and, and started a program um, to really work with, with, um, with people across Afghanistan. And um, I've I'm, I'm been in touch with him still today. And he is the most impressive young person. And um, what he's done, what he had done in terms of um, his work when he returned in building his own network. He looked at what ECA was doing here. He understood what we had done by bringing him here. And he tried to do the same. 
um, around, like in Kabul and in Afghanistan. And um, he was very committed to that, to that idea, the idea that we helped raise and teach him, which is um, bringing people together, uh, t uh, sharing information um, can be transformational. Um, so th he was, I'm gonna look at some of my colleagues, I don't remember his name um, at this moment, um, I think it was Shakib. it's in my phone. <laughs> um, but he, he really, uh, it, it was an example, because he was especially young, of someone who came here and really took to what we were uh, trying to do and tried to bring it home. Well, can people hear me? Um, well, there are a lot of innovators that come to mind for me. There are a lot of innovators that come to mind for me. Uh, one that comes to mind immediately is uh, John Register. Uh, John Register is a, a, a sports envoy that went out several times, uh, close to four times. He was supposed to be in the Olympics, and he had an injury, and he ended up becoming, uh, getting his leg amputated. Um, and then he became a silver medalist as a Paralympian. Uh, he uh, ended up being the person that did the fireside chat for all the U.S. ambassadors. He mentored several people around the world and what he did was he helped mentor the people that created the Paralympic Training Center in Nur Sultan, Kazakhstan, which I went out to go see. And so to me, he was incredibly innovative. Last, uh, when I was in my position, we had uh, the 30th anniversary of the American for Disabilities Act. So we really focused a lot on inclusion and um, he, to me, was a really big innovator. Um, another one that just comes to mind is, uh, we mentioned the Digital Communication Network. Uh, one of the top leaders in that group came to see me. Uh, he had been put in prison twice, and he actually uh, did a, a map, a, a book this big, of all the micro-influencers in Central Asia and Eastern Europe. So think about this for a minute. Uh, we're trying to get the information out in, in the area of disinformation. Chad, I think you talked about this a little bit. And you have to kind of create like a hub and spoke. And you, sometimes you think, oh, it's the big influencers. You know, somebody's got like a million Twitter followers. But what he explained to me was, well, let's say you went to college with somebody. And when they uh, send you a note or do a tweet, these are the people that are going to motivate you as a micro-influencer to do something and to communicate that out. So I just want to say he was very brave. And he's just a good example of someone that was really innovative. That's wonderful. And John Register, we sent out to the USA Pavilion at Expo 2020 Dubai as well. Oh, so, oh, yeah, oh, so, yeah, so yeah, he's that. definitely influencing. Um, and awesome. yeah. thank you. Um, so uh, rather than an individual, um, I think I'll mention a group. Um, it's Tech Women, and it cut across all, at least four of the assistant secretaries who were who were with us today, and I. Uh, had the honor of traveling with the group of American tech women mentors to, uh, we were in Jordan, and we were meant to go into classrooms where young women were studying STEM early on, and they were doing robotics and classes, and, and um, we were talking about American innovation and tech, and these young girls were just coding and putting together all these incredible models and I remember the American mentors, um, it, it's, it, it's a moment when the light bulb goes off and you can see the power of an authentic engagement with someone impacts you more than it, it, it impacts them. And they all walked away with this incredible experience and then become, um, you know, the, it's what the multiplier effect. So then they come back and they talk about their experience and this young girl that they met in Jordan and what she was going on to do. And I think, in fact, out of that program, one of the American mentors actually funded that young girl to start her own startup. And you can, can never really capture every single moment like that that creates something later down the road. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll, I think that was an impactful group and had sort of a, each one of them could tell 10 stories like that. Yeah, that's incredible. That multiplier effect is right. incredible. Yeah, and the fact that, I just want to comment one more, 
And one more thing you all said, which is what I really love, is that I, I came to this um, during my days in Congress, and that nonpartisan um, joy, I think, for this work is incredible because they know that international affairs is based on relationships and that those relationships are made, of, you know, made up of a million different interactions and a lot of those that you're making happen. So, so thank you for all the work that you've done. And I will hand it over to the audience to ask questions. Um, if I think we have time for about two. And so if you can come up to the microphone and just state your name and affiliation. Ladies, i um, delighted to be here and honored. My name is John Bader. I'm the executive director of the Fulbright Association. And my dad, Bill, was one of your predecessors. Um, so I'm, I'm especially pleased to be here. Uh, this month, May, is uh, advocacy month for the Fulbright community. We're going to Capitol Hill primarily by Zoom uh, to ask for more money. Uh, 12 years, 12 years of flat funding. Uh, we are asking for a 45% increase to the Fulbright program. My question to the three of you is, what argument would you make <laughs> for such an increase? Um, we have our arguments, and I'm happy to share them with you, but uh, I'd be delighted to hear what you would say. Next week, I'm sitting down with Rosa DeLauro, and I'm going to make this argument as the rest of our community is. So uh, what are your suggestions? I have a, one quick suggestion. I would say that um, uh, I would be, you would use the money to increase the pro Fulbright programs in the countries that surround Ukraine and Russia right now and just really give the ability to people in that area and region to have this experience and then bring that skill set back. I think there's a great deal of enthusiasm right now in Congress for um, issues related to Ukraine and to Russia. So anything that would enhance that, that's what I would. That, that, Go ahead, That Marie. was an outstanding idea. <laughs> um, when I was in my position, uh, Congress gave us $12 million a year for countering Russia disinformation. So you could actually, we did actually um, grow the number of Fulbrighters in that Russia periphery. We also added uh, more people in the FLEX program, for example. But uh, so therefore, plussing that up would be very helpful. Yeah. Uh, but uh, two, I just want to also add that I, I also felt very strongly about public-private partnerships and asking other countries to step up. At least 12 countries stepped up and increased their contribution. Uh, Hungary quadrupled their contribution. Greece tripled their contribution. On the sidelines of the United Nations, Albania, um, added more Bul uh, Bulgaria, STEM was increased in UK, France, for example. And, and then I also got more companies to contribute. So the reason I say that is, I think that you should also say that you're, we want the US taxpayer to invest, but you're gonna continue to try to help to get other countries to increase their contribution and, and also companies. And then going back to the uh, Russia periphery, I think that's a good, uh, way to, you know, kind of focus the attention. Yeah, actually part of the problem is that other countries have been making up for the fact that we are not investing in our own people. Right. Uh, 12 years of flat funding is a sign of that very fact. Lee? Well, I would just add, hello, John, it's good to see Hi, you. Hi, nice to see you too. Um, of course, no surprise, my predecessors have excellent ideas and they're spot on. I would only add, um, maybe that it allows for U.S. citizens to also be engaged because it's including Americans and in becoming Fulbright, so it's not just for those in other countries, so that's a nice um, uh, aspect of the program, and that it still resonates with young people. I remember I've got um, two, not I remember I've got, I have two college-age kids. I know that I have two college-age kids, go. but I remember <laughs> once speaking to uh, my sons and some of their kids, and they said, what is the job that you're getting ready to go and do? And I was explaining, 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 and eyes were glazing over, and I said, Fulbright. And they were like, oh, ah. Fulbright. So it still resonates with young people, and it's an audience that's incredibly important. So I would add those two things. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's an honor to be with you. Appreciate it. Good luck with the ask, John. <laughs> Thank you. We'll need it. <laughs> yes. 
Hi, is this working? Okay. Hi, my name is Sarah Shorenstein, and I am a uh, senior here at George Washington University. At, oh, sorry. Um, and hopefully, I will actually be attending United uh, University of Southern California's public diplomacy program in the fall. So that's really exciting. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And I'm actually also an intern here in the E office. So. That's really exciting too. Um, but I wanted to ask kind of for the future generation of, I don't know, um, for the future generation of public, I'm hoping to go into public diplomacy, what kind of advice do you have um, in terms of how to approach public diplomacy in terms of what, you kind of touched on this a little bit with STEM, but um, what areas do you think are going to be the future of public diplomacy and how do you uh, I guess recommend a student who's looking to go into it to approach it. And what was interesting was I was just in a class that basically said that there are only five public diplomacy programs at universities throughout the country, which I found really fascinating, although different classes and different programs. But uh, I was wondering your thoughts on that as well and how we can bring that about for more students to try. Thank you again. So I, I just first want to commend you because I have to say when I was your age, I don't think I was aware uh, no, of the concept of public diplomacy. I wish that I were. And thanks to people like Oli and, and the great work of USC, I'm so glad to hear that you're interested and that you're aware of it because it really is um, an amazing opportunity. I've, that's why you know, when I said what I said, it's true. To be able to get up every day and basically do your best to build bridges between the United States and countries around the world and enhance understanding and basically promote peace um, is, is what we're trying to do by, by really bringing people together. So um, I don't know if I have an answer about the future other than I think what I found in my role, I don't know about my, my colleagues, is it, it was hard to predict because it really, as we've just heard, depended on current events mm -hmm. and things that were happening um, that, the, that were the priorities of the department. Um, and, and for instance, the DCN that we talked about, the Digital Communications Network, was really born out of what we saw with Russia and what they were trying to do with misinformation and disinformation. Um, one other thing I'll say is, is um, at one point I tried to move money in a program um, and that did not go so well. <laughs> so the other thing I would say about Fulbright is Congress takes such a great interest <laughs> in these programs, so, so you, you may find champions up there that, that are going to emerge for you. But, um, but it's hard to say right now about the future, in my, in my view, other than things like climate change and, and um, disinformation seems to be here to stay. I don't know what else well, we might think I was, of. I was just going to add that I think that public diplomacy goes into every area. I, when I think of the Fulbright program, it's always amazing. It's, you could be in the arts, so you could be public service, you could be in STEM. But what I think is really important is thinking of ways that we can continue to grow the networks. And one of the things that comes to mind was, uh, was the fact that when we pivoted in the COVID era, we still had to counter the disinformation. And then one of the ways we did that is through English language training. So if people know English, they can read American content. Yeah. And our webinars were hitting over one million people at a time trying to learn English, which is so incredible. Yeah. So every time I think of every program, I think of the scale. Uh, I was actually just watching a video I did at the Wilson Center uh, and from the GSNP program, which is Global Sports Mentoring, and we won the Stuart Scott Inspire Award. And Dr. Sarah Hillier said, the 99 million women, the 99 women have affected 225,000 people. So, you know, and the story I gave was about Dima in Jordan, who actually brought all these young kids from the refugee camps, thousands and thousands and thousands of them, and engaged them. So I think to think of ways that how we, can we scale these up and get more people. And then I worked a lot on the Stevens Initiative, and my vision was that every person in the United States that wants to be part of a uh, exchange program, whether it's virtual or in person, should be able to be part of one. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And I would just add the the thing. One of the things that I love about public diplomacy is that um, 
it, it is playing the long game to be sure in finding leaders in other countries who will one day, well, young people who will one day be leaders either in government, civil society, business, all across the um, different fields. And that's incredibly important because mm -hmm. 20 years after they came on a program, they're gonna do something impactful and they'll remember the time that they spent in the United States connecting with individuals. Mm -hmm. But it is also strategic and responsive to the world events that both Evan and Marie just spoke about. And we're continuing to find ways to do both. And as Secretary Blinken likes to say, we row, rest of world. So we're continuing to row but we're also thinking about how we can creatively and strategically use exchanges to be react to react to what's happening in the world and Liz Allen and I talk about that all the time and how we in, in public diplomacy have to do both. Thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Libby. If you don't have time, I wasn't no, sure. No, I think we've got time. Um, <laughs> hi, uh, Libby Rosenbaum. I'm the CEO of the American Council of Young Political Leaders. Uh, Marie is an alum, as is <laughs> Congressman Royce. Good yeah, to see you both. Thank you. Um, my question, I think primarily is for Lee, although I'd love um, Evan and, and Marie's buy-in. Um, it's an understatement to say it's been a challenging two years for program partners trying to do this work, who love it deeply, and who have um, struggled with COVID mightily. Um, I was curious if there was any opportunities for program partners to come together to talk about ways that they've been able to innovate during COVID, because I feel like we've all been very, um, I hate to use the word siloed, but we have been. Um, I mean, personally, I had two children at home while trying to keep my organization alive. Um, so I didn't have a lot of time for conversations. Um, but I think that we all agree that we wanna do more things in person and we wanna get more people out and to the extent that other program partners are having success doing that, I would love to be able to get together and, and share true best practices in a time of extreme challenge, so thank you. Yeah, Libby, thank you. I should have said that in my remarks, I, oh, something about the program partners and not only did I say, hey everybody, thanks, is Kristen still here? Oh, she's yeah. behind the mic. Um, <laughs> I was sort of recognizing and talking about how important that was. I should have said thank you. Um, when I came in uh, in November, no one was in the office. And December, no one was in the office. January, no one was in the office. And we're just starting to physically come back into the office. And while many of our programs were continuing in person, the majority of them went virtual, as you well know. And it, was only by the amazing effort of the program partners, Global Ties, IREX, ACYPL, everybody. We've done one everybody. in person, <laughs> And so it, it's, it's incredible how you've stayed afloat, and I know that that has been a challenge, and I should have said something about that. I love the idea of bringing program partners together. Love that. Where's Tally? Is she still here? So, um, well, of course, for Sally. Sure. <laughs> I'll give it to Jillian, Jillian Duty at ECA to take away and we'll bring everybody together in some way to share Thank best you. practices because the secretary said to me on day one, how are you going to take the things that were done well and that you can build on and create these hybrid models? Because nothing's going to take place of people to people but we need to continue to innovate and grow our reach. And how are you gonna take the good things that were done and, and move that forward? So we need to do that with, with all of you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kristen, last Thank question. Thank you. And it turns out if your only child is graduating from college on the other side of the country and everyone you know who has COVID, you can recommit to wearing these dreadful things. <laughs> um, I'm Kristen Lord, I'm the president and CEO of IREX. Great to see you all. Um, we are very proud to implement the Mandela Washington Fellowship Program of YALI, uh, but my question is uh, actually about Europe. I do not remember a time in my life when public diplomacy seemed more central to the core US foreign policy challenges, certainly not since 9-11. And I am wondering, at a time when the solidarity of publics in the US and in Europe, the commitment to democracy and democratic principles, the willingness to sustain support for Ukraine, public support for Ukraine, the willingness to keep up and increase pressure on Russia when the public costs are gonna get higher and higher, especially in Europe, when disinformation is so rife and the Russians are way better at that than modern war fighting, public diplomacy should be so central to the efforts. 
to, on each of those fronts. Does public diplomacy have that vaunted seat at the table? What can all of us do to help you make the case? Thank you, Kristen. Um, you know who I hear talk about this all day, over and over, all the time? Liz Allen. I would love to just ask her. She's always talking about public diplomacy, seat at the table, in on the ground floor. I'd love to ask her to speak on that because I think it's important. Sure. Hi, Kristen. It's like you took the words out of my mouth. And Lee can tell you, Lee and I meet a lot, and we always talk about this. And I would just say a couple things. Um, one is the unique opportunity that we have coming out of Russia, Ukraine, like everyone has spoken about. Um, there's no better way to talk about needing to have a seat at the table than to show what we've done with our seat at the table. And I think we have had an unprecedented seat at the table during Russia, Ukraine, so this is the moment to build on it. Um, I say it to our colleagues, I say it to our leadership, and I say it to our colleagues at the NSC, because it really does take talking to everybody in that 360 ecosystem to say we need to be in on the ground floor. And this is actually something I talked about with the secretary just about two weeks ago. And his response, as an avid supporter of public diplomacy, um, was to say, I support you 100%. When PD professionals are brought in at the beginning of any policy or strategy process, it has a better intellectual rigor and intellectual honesty to the process. So go run. So we are going to do that. Um, I, you know, we will not bore everybody with our bureaucratic hurdles. Of course, we are changing years and years of process and structure and culture. But, um, but I think that we do have a seat at the table, particularly with our team on the field. Um, we finally have people in place here at the department. We are having people get in place at the National Security Council and others um, just to be able to round out who can fill that seat. And we're really energized to do so. Yeah. I wonder. Thank you. That's incredible, Liz. Well, thank you for your leadership. And Kristen, thank you for your question. And um, I'll just, just a second Libby's um, point, because we do talk quite a bit as implementing partners. We at Global Ties um, could not have gotten through the last two years without ECA's leadership. Thank you. And a shout out to Ann Grimes, who runs the Office of National okay. Visitors. We Thanks. are so deeply grateful to you. <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry, Marie. Oh, Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. I just want to add for everyone, um, the United States Senate and the U.S. House Representatives uh, asked for a report from ECA, and this was not a public report. This is a more of a private report uh, to see whether exchanges matter and they should keep uh, funding ECA at the level. Uh, we were, when I was in my role, we were at an unprecedented $760 million, which is very, very good. Um, and what w they did was they interviewed 300 different stakeholders. And when I was interviewed, I, I said that 30% of the Ukrainian parliament was currently, uh, were, were all alums of the um, ECA programs, like especially Future Leaders Exchange. Now, I'm gonna tell you why it matters to go back to the question uh, that Kristen Lord asked. Um, the other day I talked to Ambassador Daniel Mulhall. He's an alum of the Bridge USA, um, the J1 program. And he mentioned to me that the parliamentarians from Ukraine are incredibly articulate about getting the message out. It's clear to him that many of them are our ECA alumni. So, the, so what I want to share is that's a good example why public diplomacy matters, because it's those types of individuals that are part of that standing up, articulating, countering Russian disinformation. And so I, I think that's incredibly important. And well, we are out of time, and I know I'm keeping you from the reception. So um, before I thank our past or current and past two assistant secretaries, I also want to acknowledge Ann Stock, um, former assistant secretary of ECA. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for your foundational leadership. And Goli, thank you so much for this incredible prize that's going to continue to inspire. And Chad, congratulations to you and Gretchen again. So everyone, please join me in thanking Lee Satterfield, Marie Royce, and Evan Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.